Good morning, everybody. Pleased to have you here. Just a short announcement. We have translation uh, this morning in German, English, French, Italian, Spanish, and uh, Polish. And you can select the language uh, here in the room with a little device. And also the um, people who, have, uh, who are joining us from outside can click on a button on uh, the left below that says floor, and then you can choose your language and switch your language as often as you want. And with this, I hand over to Martin Häusling, our host today. So a very warm welcome from my side. We have translation, so you can switch. Uh, I switch in German. So let me start by welcoming everyone here to our conference, which we're finally able to hold in person. And the fact that it's so urgent to hold this kind of conference is evident from developments in recent years. We've seen the Commission and Conservative parties moving to give untrammeled approval to GMOs. Those of you who have been looking at this issue for a number of years will know that we had this whole argument 20 years ago. We were told that GMOs were the response to all the questions that we had and we know that GMOs over the last 20 years have been known as products which are resistant to pesticides, but their seed actually contains a lot of toxins. But we have a new strategy for agriculture, which includes the Commission proposing a reintroduction of GMOs, new kinds of D GMOs. So thank you very much for all of you for coming along in s such good numbers today. That does prove that there is a feeling against GMOs. We feel that there needs to be clear labelling of GMOs. That's essential for organic farmers who can't use GMO products at all. We need to have a risk assessment for these products. We can't just stop doing that. We need to have legislation comparable to what we have so as to be able to continue to perform those risk assessments. All sorts of new plants are appearing. I saw a new dry <laughs> designer tomato is, has just been released. Perhaps you can get three different color stripes on it, but we do need to have resistance in plants, but I don't think GMOs are going to provide drought resistance and resistance to other problems such as heat. So this is a really important issue. The commission is due to present a proposal next year So we need to organise our opposition in preparation. And as civil society, we need to make it very clear that we're not happy with the, commo the Commission and Conservative proposals. We need to say that we want a GMO-free Europe. So thank you very much. Okay. Martin Weitz. Thomas, Entschuldigung. Thomas Weitz uh, is uns zugeschaltet wegen eines Trauerf. Thomas Weitz is online because of personal reasons. Fortunately, I can't join you physically because I have to and will attend the funeral of my grandmother, uh, which is uh, of great importance to me. Uh, but what is uh, of <laughs> very high importance as well, and, and that's why I, I still wanted to say some welcoming words to you, is that we counter this uh, attempt of industry uh, to kind of get around a proper regulation of GMOs and to try to kind of uh, deconstruct Construct the very legitimate resistance of many regions of the European Union against this technology. I mean, what do we see here? We saw GMO-free regions across the whole European Union flourishing. It uh, is for the regions a quality of uh, nature friendliness, uh, of respect towards biodiversity. It's a clear statement that we shouldn't do experiments uh, with genetically modified plants in free nature. Uh, and, and this is a very important uh, uh, movement that we would like to kind of revitalize uh, and, and keep, keep up the pace 
face of resistance against GMOs. Um, what do we hear from industry? We hear a lot of fake announcements. New GMOs will save the, 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 the world in terms of hunger, so we'll feed the world. Uh, new GMOs will, will tackle all the problematics of climate change uh, and, and droughts and so on. Uh, well, uh, new GMOs will solve any pests and reduce pesticides uh, and even arguments come. Why, why? This would actually be the most important thing for organic agriculture because this could lead to zero pesticide agriculture. But just reality is that these announcements are not met with reality. Reality looks completely different. Reality shows that it's basically, and Martin mentioned, it's basically about uh, varieties that are resistant against herbicides or produce pesticides within them and are harming nature. Uh, what industry also says is, well, you know, these new GMOs were just manipulating within the genome. So this is the difference to the old G uh, GMO techniques. And this is actually the same as nature would also do and the same that could happen naturally. Well, first of all, the question is, if that can be happening naturally and if they, you can't see the difference, why do you want to have patents on that then? And there we are at the actual core of this whole propaganda, I would say, uh, propaganda move of the industry. The real interest of industry is to have patented seeds that are directly linked to certain uses of pesticides. As we know, most of these uh, big seed producers are actually chemical companies that bought up seed companies to basically sell their chemical products. And indeed, what we're, what we're doing here is not opposing a technology as such. To have genetically modified organisms in closed bioreactors in a safe environment is something that we see also that is improving uh, the production of our medication as an example. We can also use this technology for gene sequestration. So we can actually have classical breeding systems where we can then check the produce of our, uh, of our breeding uh, with genetical sequestration and through this accelerate classical breeding techniques. But for this industry has no interest at all because for a classical classical breeding technology, even if you accelerated the speed with a, a gen genetical sequestration, you cannot claim patents. And patents is everything industry is about, and we have to acknowledge that everything else are fake arguments, fake arguments towards nature protection or towards, I don't know, uh, helping farmers. And we need to counter that. It's a big propaganda and big campaign from the side of the industry, and it's going to be an uphill battle to stop them uh, uh, in, in, a, in an approach uh, to take over agriculture, to take control over food production and to play uh, um, with our environment uh, in our agricultural sector. And for this, I want to welcome you all and I'm happy to see so many people here. Uh, we will join forces and do our best to tackle this very, I would say, uh, uh, very uh, heavy attempt of industry to take over here. Thanks very much for coming and uh, we will see each other in the next few months side by side fighting this attempt. Thank you very much. Vielen Dank, uh, Tom. Thank you very much, Thomas Weitz. <clears throat> I'm glad to be back in the European Parliament representing civil society on GMO-free regions. We held our first conference in 2005. In 2010, we held another. Then in 2012, here in the Parliament, and the ninth conference on GMO-free regions was held in 2018 in Berlin, together with the presidency of the Hessen GMO-free government. I had hoped that the 2018 conference might be the last meeting because we had the ECJ ruling that the CRISPR-Cas technique qualified as gene technology as defined in EU legislation for the last 30 years. But the Commission and other interested parties looked at that sentence and saw that the way to proceed was to consider all other gene modifications as something that 
needed to be renamed and rebranded. So they call them mutations. There's this notion of precision breeding. There's new genomic techniques. This cisgenesis and this whole cloud of new concepts which are essentially different forms of gene technologies and techniques so as to create the impression that anything that in future qualifies as modification of genes needs to be excluded from the current legislation now obviously we will be fighting against that proposal. We anticipate that the proposal will be out in the n about six months. But we want to hear about what your plans are. We're delighted to see from the list of registrants that we have Briar Syngenta and other PR agencies who have been working hard on the Commission proposal are present today. So I look forward to having a discussion on the question of safety and transparency in relation to gene editing and gene techniques. Now this is a GMO free Europe conference so please don't feel that, that you can reasonably expect everyone to have an opportunity to speak we're going to be talking about GMO free status, so we're going to be hearing a lot from organic farmers, but other agroecological approaches will be described in relation to agriculture and food. Now we're often presented as Greens as always being opposed to something, but actually over the last 50 years we have been arguing in favour of a different approach uh, an approach that involves respect for nature, respect for consumers who should have accurate information about what is being produced and what it, they are putting on their plates. So I think this time, by the end of our conference, we should have had an opportunity to express the views of European consumers who have been saying for 20 years now that they don't want to have GMOs on their plate. I think that we should be able to assert that argument, but at the moment it does feel that if we look at the introduction from the EU Commission and the consultation, it does look very much as though everything is just going to be very clear and very reasonable because there isn't any risk. Now I would argue that this is a position that we're going to need to discuss at great length over the next six months because that isn't a scientific approach at all. I think that we can take an educated perspective in our discussions on the risks and the safety. It's not that we're just outright rejecting GM. That doesn't have to be the way that this goes, but I think an open and honest discussion of the risks and a shared decision on what risks we're willing to accept should be possible. So I look forward to today's meeting and I'm going to give the floor now to Silke Maloney from the state of Hesse, who are the presidents of the gene, gene free governance organization. And, and uh, online, first of all, I would like to send greetings from Priska Hinz, the Minister of Environment, uh, Agriculture, Climate and Consumer Protection in um, uh, of the state of Hessen. And she regrets very much that she can't be here today for this very timely and also important uh, topic. She would also like to thank the Greens EFA group, as well as the other organizations involved in the preparation of the conference for highlighting the debate about the new ge genomic uh, breeding techniques before the announced proposal by the Commission as it's already been laid out by the previous speakers. Um, 
from the statements made by the Commission, as already has been mentioned, it is uh, very clear that these new techniques are, are seen as part of the implementation of the Green New Deal for a greener future um, agricultural system. Instead of relying on new breeding techniques to make agriculture more resilient in a changing climate, Hessen wants to further organic farming. This should help to counteract the advancing climate change, preverse biodiversity, and protect water and soil. Hessen's goal is to further develop the entire state into a model region for sustainable agriculture. Promoting sustainable agriculture not only protects the environment and the climate, but also offers many farmers a long-term perspective. It also shows that agriculture and environment protection are not opposites, but must be thought of together. In, H in Hessen, we have a very clear commitment by the coalition partners to ensure that the cultivation of genetically modified plants, as well as breeding and keeping of genetically modified animals, does not take place in Hessen. This is in line with the wishes of consumers and farmers in our region. This expressly includes the processes of new genetic engineering. An EU-wide solution in this regard would be desirable. If necessary, however, the Hessen government will take the necessary measures for the region. Currently, Hessen is preparing a nature protection law that bans the cultivation of GMOs in Hessen. Regarding the announced proposal by the Commission, the goal of the Hessen Ministry for Environment and Agriculture remains to follow the pre precautionary principle and make sure that the risk assessment, traceability, and labeling of food and feed produced by the, with the aid of new genetic engineering method, methods remain in place. This position was expressed by the network of GMO-free regions in its Berlin declaration that was adopted during the meeting in Berlin in 2018, as already has been mentioned, keeping most of the European member states and regions free of the cultivation of genetically modified organisms was seen by these regions to be a substantial advantage for European farmers as well as for biodiversity and soil fertility. I hope that the current debate will revitalize the work of the network of the GMO-free regions and maybe today's conference can be a starting point for that. So I wish everybody an interesting conference and I'm looking forward to the debates. Thank you. Vielen Dank. Uh, Thank you very much. So the Hesse presidency has also got a representative, uh, a deputy, Upper Austria. Unfortunately, the state council leader has been unable to attend, but has sent us a video message. Dear ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately I'm not able to attend the event today in person, but I would like to address greetings to you and thank you for your interest in this important topic. Austria is a pioneer concerning GM-free production and organic production. Upper Austria, with many other regions and institutions, has strongly advocated for the right to stay GMO-free years ago. Now. The European Commission is discussing relaxing the rules of new genomic techniques and a proposal on this is expected by the middle of next year. The European Commission sees great potential in new genomic techniques in terms of achieving the goals for the Green Deal and the farm to fork strategy. For some of us the arguments put forward may sound very familiar. But opportunities often come along with risks. Therefore. We need to use new techniques responsibly and without giving up our high standards in protection. Providing exemptions could allow genetically modified plants to end up unlabeled and without risk assessment in food. This would have direct consequences for the free choice of consumers. In line with the ruling by the European Court of Justice in 2018, the Ninth Conference of GMO-Free Regions stated in its Berlin Declaration that, I quote, the regulation of all GMOs and methods for genetic engineering are subject to precautionary risk assessment and transparent approval procedures as well as labeling and traceability obligations under GMO legislation, 
end of quote. As regional minister for consumer protection in Upper Austria, I can only welcome this. It is my clear position to maintain strict provisions for genetic engineering at EU label. I am pleased that today's event will actively contribute to the discussion on the challenges of those new techniques. It is important to team up stakeholders and gain public awareness for this issue upfront the legislative procedure. So I thank you. I thank the organizations engaged for hosting this event and I wish you all interesting discussions. All the best from Upper Austria. Thank you very much. And now I hand over the um, next session to my colleague Eric Gall from IFOAM, the Organic uh, Farmers and Consumers Movement in Europe, is the co-organizer of this uh, GMO Free Europe conference today. And we are now entering into the scientific part of our session. Eric and uh, the other scientists are welcome to join us here. This is the control thing for the, for the, site, uh, for the presentation. Thank you very much, Benny, and good morning to everybody. Uh, so indeed, I represent IFOAM Organics Europe. Uh, and uh, as you know, the organic movement, um, first of all, we'd like to thank Martin Osling and the Green Group in the European Parliament for hosting this event, which we are very pleased to have co-organized with uh, Save Our Seeds. And I would like to thank my colleagues from IFOAM Organics Europe, in particular, uh, Elena Schmutzler for organizing this event. As you know, the organic movement has taken a very clear stance at the international level uh, on the fact that genetic engineering techniques are not compatible with the principles of organic farming. The organic movement has been a driver for innovation, but we believe that innovation uh, should fully take into account farmers' needs uh, and should, be, uh, uh, should respect the natural resources on which we depend for food production uh, as well. Uh, we hear a lot the same language elements in the last months, that allegedly this genetic engineering techniques, gene editing, uh, would only achieve uh, modifications that could happen in nature or that could be achieved through conventional breeding. We hear as well that uh, they are necessary to contribute to sustainability and to achieve the goals of a farm to fork strategy to transition to sustainable food systems. Well, uh, with this first panel, we will precisely hear from scientists to what extent uh, this is a reality uh, or not. So I have a pleasure uh, to welcome our three uh, panelists uh, today. Uh, but I will first introduce them uh, uh, before they speak. And I think we will start with a presentation uh, by Dr. Eva Galinsky, uh, who is joining us uh, online. Dr. Galinsky is an independent scientist from Switzerland. Uh, she's an expert on seed policies and science. She's also working as policy coordinator of the initiative for GA free seeds and breeding. She is a member of a federal ethics committee on non-human biotechnology in Switzerland. And with her presentation, she will dissect precisely this narrative of on sustainability of novel genomic techniques such as drought resistance. Good morning, Eva. Are Good you morning. with us? Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for the introduction. Well, I don't know if that is my presentation. Okay, it's coming. Perfect. Yes, as we already heard, new genetic engineering methods are being brought into play as a solution in order to meet the challenges of climate change. Next slide, please. The new genetic engineering methods, such as CRISPR and ABLE, among other things, several simultaneous changes within the genetic material, which are hardly possible with conventional methods. This is linked to the hope of accelerating research and breeding in order to find adventurous characteristics and develop new combinations more quickly than before. 
The techniques are used, for example, to study the regulation of genes and their involvement in the response to climatic stress factors. However, generating stress tolerance in plants by means of genetic engineering will remain a challenge, even with the new methods. For there is no single trait, for example, drought tolerance, that can be bred for or even integrated into plants. To stay with the example of drought tolerance, plants have numerous ways of reacting to a lack of water. They can, for example, root deeper, root wider, grow more fine roots, grow thick, a thicker wax layer on the leaves, or more leaf hair to reduce evaporation. Which of these reactions plants are capable of, or particularly capable of, depends within their species characteristics on the genetics of the individual plant or variety. Each of the characteristics just mentioned, for example, the ability to root deeper, does not in itself make a drought-tolerant plant. From this, it follows first of all. Breeding for drought tolerance is not a simple matter, but a highly complex one, because the stress response of plants is multidimensional, involving various signaling pathways regulated, for example, by phytohormones and other volatile organic components. Next slide, please. This network must first be understood in detail, but also precisely in its complexity. Next slide, please. Genome editing methods have so far been used mainly in basic research to study the complex interplay of different signaling pathways. For this purpose, mainly small changes are made to the genome, stress genes are switched on or off, for example, in order to better understand what role they play in the plant's stress response. Next slide, please. This leads to individual findings, but not to an understanding of the complexity as a whole. Furthermore, an intended intervention in the complex interplay of different signaling pathways within the cell with genome editing techniques can have an impact on many other properties. Second, traits that contribute to a certain drought tolerance are anchored in the overall constitution of plants. This means that improving drought tolerance through breeding is almost always linked to further fundamental plant physiological changes. Deeper root growth, for example, consumes energy that the plant actually need, needs elsewhere to grow. This is why, for example, crop yields are reduced, growth is slowed down early, quality suffers and the grains are smaller. That means if we want to breed drought tolerant plants, we must therefore be prepared to adapt to other types of plants and change our cultivation and food habits accordingly. It will not work to think that the type of high yielding variety that dominates agriculture today can simply be equipped with additional drought tolerance. But there is another problem. In Europe, too, we are increasingly confronted with strongly fluctuating climatic conditions. Even, very, even if it currently looks like the spring and summer droughts will increase, there may, may still be some very wet years in the future. In addition, there will be an increase in extreme events such, such as heavy rainfall or very high temperature. The problems triggered by these fluctuations cannot simply be solved by equipping plants with drought resistance or specific disease resistance, regardless of the breeding method. The volatility of climatic conditions is decisive. It will hardly be possible to genetically equip a single variety in such a way that it can produce maximum yields in all expected climatic extremes. In addition, at the beginning of the year, when the farmer has to decide on a variety, he does not know what the growing season will be like. Dry, wet, very hot or rather cool. Next slide, please. The good news is that there are already solutions available that could be implemented very quickly. I will just give one example. It is possible to grow different varieties of a species, such as wheat, in a mixture. The yields and quality characteristics of these mixtures are often better than the average of their pure seeds. This means 
that by cultivating in mixtures, more can be harvested than if the respective varieties were cultivated separately. The different varieties have different characteristics. Varieties with long roots absorb water from deeper layers in dry conditions. Varieties with shallow root roots absorb surface water better in wetter years. If the varieties are grown together, the mixture has both properties and is more stable in yield. The differences between the mixture partners can increase overall resilience, that, for example, the ability to withstand weather extremes. Next slide, please. I will sum up. In view of the effects of climate change that can already be observed and the developments that are emerging globally, there is a great urgency to adapt agriculture in Europe to the rapidly changing conditions. Due to the complexity of climate-relevant traits I've just described, it cannot be assumed that the new genetic engineering approaches can contribute to the adaption of agriculture to global warming. It is not, it is not to be expected that climate-adapted varieties developed using CRISPR-Cas will be available, available, available quickly, if at all. Next slide, please. This is also emphasized by the Swiss Ethics Committee on Non-Human Biotechnology in its latest report. The clear majority of members are skeptical about the ability of new genetic engineering approaches to make a relevant contribution to the adaption of agriculture in the required time frame. Next slide, please. On the other hand, various solutions are already available to adapt agriculture to the rapidly changing conditions. Next slide. But in this context, it is necessary to avoid path dependency in both research and practice. Other research and breeding approaches must be neither neglected nor impeded by investing in only one technological approach. For pre precautionary reasons, they must be organized in such a way that multiple paths remain open for agriculture to, to fulfill its ethically indispensable tasks namely ensuring adequate food as well as protecting biodiversity. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gelensky. And uh, indeed, I think any organic farmer would be able to tell you that uh, uh, to have a resilient farming system, uh, first of all, you would need a uh, uh, healthy soil. And the whole idea that you could claim that a product is sustainable on the basis of a trait or a given variety is, uh, is certainly a bit uh, simplistic. So thank you for clarifying these aspects. Uh, now we will turn um, to the issue of, uh, of uh, risk assessment and precisely of the narratives uh, that surround uh, new genetic engineering techniques. And uh, we have a pleasure to have with us Dr. Christoph Ten. Uh, who is the executive director of Test Biotech and the coordinator of a coalition No Patents on Seeds. With a background in veterinary science, uh, Christoph has been working for about 20 years on issues in the field of biotechnology. And his presentation will indeed uh, address issues around the EFSA report, the European Food Safety Authority report, and the proposed risk assessment requirements. Christoph, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. I was told I can tell you everything, but it should not take longer than 10 minutes, so I try to be short. And apologies to the translators. <laughs> so uh, I'm representing Test Biotech in this meeting. Uh, Test Biotech is following science from the perspective of the health uh, of, of the protection goals, such as human health and the environment and nature. And we just recently published a report, and or we were pleased that our report was published, which was written by us. Um, and so you can find it online and you can read what I might have omitted or not explained properly. Uh, so um, next slide, how does this work? Nothing does work. Uh, what was wrong with this? Um, uh, okay, now it looks better. Okay. So um, the main finding from this report are that um, the, the, the differences between conventional breeding and the new genomic techniques might be easily overlooked, but they might also have severe consequences if they are overlooked. So we, we describe the differences and we describe the intended and the unintended differences. 
on genetic level, on the level of the organism and the level of the environment. And we found out that EFSA never had a mandate to fully assess the unintended effects. That's a quote you see um, at the right hand side, yeah. Um, they committed themselves. So we think uh, it's a, it's a risk that the European Commission will come to the wrong conclusions based on lack of data or lack of um, scrutiny. Next slide. Um, ah, okay. So one reason for um, the unintended effects are the complex mechanisms um, to perform uh, new genomic techniques. Uh, first step is a multi-step process, and the first step, for example, you first have to integrate the DNA for the genes and to the cells. So we have a transgenic plant the, uh, inheriting the DNA of a gene system. Of course, this also goes along with unintended effects. Next slide. And um, as a risk, if these um, uh, unintended effects escape, the attention uh, are, ex uh, are explained, exemplified in the case of a dehorned cattle which in his um, genome had a bacterial DNA, which was overlooked by the um, researchers and also by the authorities in Brazil. And if you use such a cattle for further breeding, these uh, unintended effects will quickly spread throughout populations. And then large populations of, uh, in this case, animals will be affected and you take measures to slaughter them maybe, as it was the case finally with this dehorned cattle. It was slaughtered and its offspring before it could be used in, in, in breeding, but this could also have been done in the opposite way. So next uh, slide. So uh, we think, um, self, because it's such a complex um, technology, we think all intended genetic changes, all unintended genetic changes have to undergo risk assessment as well as all um, intended effects, unintended effects with maybe immediate, delayed or cumulative and this is exactly what is requested by the current um, GMO regulation, and I think we think this should be applied. But, next slide, we are also afraid that the European Commission, based on lack of sufficient um, assessment, might come to the conclusion that in future the system is, gets fragmented and no longer the unintended effects are really assessed. So this would mean that many unintended effects could come to the market unintendedly and then spread throughout the populations. Next slide. We also did some um, further risks uh, the, um, uh, issues. We think also that uh, we should uh, also have a systematic approach on this and look to the overall picture of the releases into the environment. And so we see that um, a whole range, a large range of species is involved with a large number of different traits. And so we have to think about how to control this in terms of um, scale of releases, number of releases and type of releases. Next slide. So if we're not able to uh, do this, we will end up in a mess. Um, the um, ecosystems might reach to a tipping point where um, they collapse due to the uh, sheer amount of um, releases of organisms which are not adopted by evolutionary processes. And of course, next slide, if you would introduce many of them into a shared environment, this will be accelerated and um, poten potentiated. It's getting much more complex. These are findings from a recent conference you also can find online. It was conducted by Project Engineering and the Environment, these slides. Next uh, slide. So we also did some research on socio-economical impacts and there we are warning about disruptive effects. And some of them are um, on consumer choice and others are uh, regarding uh, patents. And on patents, we just want to highlight very shortly that it's not only patents, next slide. Oh, sorry, no, I shouldn't escape this one. Social and economical impacts and the need, sorry for that, this slide now, sorry, um, this slide now goes back to what, uh, what was explained already by the previous speaker. It's necessary to distinguish in regard to socio-economical impacts whether the benefits are just empty promises or whether there are really potential real benefits in the end and we exemplify this problem uh, on uh, wheat uh, uh, resulting from genome editing uh, processes. And we find out, for example, that this wheat, which might have a strong um, trait, an extreme trait, in showing some tolerance to fungal disease, on the other hand, have a trade-off, which makes them much more susceptible for uh, biotic and abiotic stressors in the environment. So this might then be counterproductive to reach really the sustainable goals. 
and the pesticide free agriculture if these traits are so, uh, extreme in a way that they compromise the vigor of the plants. And now let's go back to the patent issue. Next slide now. We are also warning about the disruptive effects patents may have. And we want to warn about it's not only patents on the technology, but next slide, it's also patents, next slide, patents on the biological resources needed by all breeders. This is a patent application by Syngenta covering 5,000 uh, single uh, nucleated, nucleated uh, polymorphisms, SMPs, uh, detected in wild relative of soybeans, and company Syngenta claims them all, all plants inheriting them, derived from breeding, not the original wild relatives, but all plants derived from breeding and technology approved, no matter whether this is conventional breeding or technology. And this means, or, or by new genomic techniques, Techniques. This means that no traditional breeder and also no expert in new genomic techniques can use these biological resources now anymore if this patent is granted. And several of these patents, which have an overlap to conventional breeding, are already granted. Next slide. So these are the claims saying, well, we want to have all these plants with all these genetic information. Next slide. So uh, this is my last slide. I hope it's still in time. I do not see a watch, but um, you will tell me. So, so we think we should keep on with case-by-case uh, -case risk assessment, fully apply the risk assessment as foreseen um, by the European regulation, maybe adopted, um, but also in to introduce now technology assessment uh, to see whether this is real benefits or just empty promises. And only if uh, both uh, levels of scrutiny are coming to a positive result, we might consider to release it, and only under these conditions also, the technology, if there are any, could develop its supposed benefits. Thank you very much for this um, possibility to give you this overview. Thank you very much, Christoph, and also for keeping the time. Um, I must say that it sounds a bit uh, um, quite surprising that EFSA was not even mandated to look at the unintended effects of um, uh, genetic engineering processes when we know that it's one of the main reasons for concerns, which is also uh, widely reported in the scientific literature. And thank you for raising the issue of patents on seeds as well. It's an aspect which is uh, often overlooked and uh, not addressed at all by the European Commission when it uh, considers this uh, potential deregulation of new genetic engineering techniques. And both your organization, No Patents on Seeds, your coalition, and uh, Via Campesina, I must say as well, have issued recently a, a very interesting report uh, on this crucial aspect, which is a, a clear threat as well to the European model uh, of, uh, of plant breeding. Uh, but we will turn to, to our last uh, uh, panelist uh, uh, to uh, enlighten us on these scientific aspects, Dr. Margaret Engelhardt. Thank you for being with us uh, this morning. Uh, you are the head of division and senior researcher on GMO regulation at the BFN, which is the German Federal Agency for Nature Conservation. And with more than 70 scientists, peer-reviewed publications on various topics surrounding GMOs like case-specific risk assessments, the effects of GMOs on wild population and gene drives, uh, your talk will shed light on the technological impact assessment requirements. So thank you. Uh, Dr. Engelhardt, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this invitation. Yes, um, I'd like to bring in a perspective for nature conservation and risk assessment. Uh, since we, I try, so maybe I'm more lucky. Um, no, please, next please. <laughs> next slide, please. Uh, since we are part of the Federal Ministry of uh, Environment, but also involved in the authorization of um, GMOs. Next slide. So um, the key question is uh, for us as risk assessor and also uh, um, um, people that like to protect nature, our key question is are there risks with these uh, new technologies um, and are there different risks or maybe less risks? So I'd like to um, do two step back um, and quickly say what we are facing now. We are facing transi tran um, transitions in biotechnology due to genome, genome editing, but also due to digitalization, artificial intelligence and automatization. It's a very dynamic field 
Uh, and also the genome editing tools themselves develop very quickly. So it's important to know that we don't always speak about the same when we talk, talk about CRISPR-Cas. There's not only one CRISPR-Cas. Next slide, please. Uh, we heard before that there are many names around, new mutagenesis, novel genomic techniques, etc. also new genetic engineering or new technology, um, genetic technology. Next slide, please. But in core, it's genome editing, it's uh, genetic engineering that can do different things. It can either, and it is, I do it always in the beginning because it's important to know what we're talking about. It can change single nucleotides or a group of single nucleotides, but this means if you change only one nucleotide, it can switch off genes, switch on genes, inhibit genes. So we can introduce genes uh, as we do in classical genetic engineering, but we also can introduce many genes. So, and what we now, the European Commission is now talking about are the first two parts. So switching off, switch, switching on genes, but also introducing genes in the case of cisgenesis. What's important um, is that we're still using the same tools in, in classical GMOs to introduce the DNA. So agrobacterium mediated or particle bombardment. Next slide, please. Um, so we have now a very powerful tool to really change the genome of all organism, to reshuffle them, to redesign them at a revolutionary new extent. No matter if you introduce new genes or not, you really change the genome now. And that means that we, on the other hand, we have limited knowledge about the effects that these changes may have. And also, we have limited knowledge about the tools, how to evaluate them. We have now on our table, when we do as a risk assessment, we have really new GMOs, also classical GMOs. Uh, if the carbon metabolism, for example, is changed, we have to think about new tools, how to evaluate this. Next slide, please. Now, in the current discussion, we also have here very often, it is familiar to nature, to breeding, and whatever. So, but from our perspective, this question is not relevant. Relevant if there are risks or not, or if there are lower risks or not. And um, being risk assessment, Cesar, we looked at what we do with risk assessment currently with GMOs and what category we look at. We look at, for example, persistence, invasiveness. Are there any problems with non-target um, organism, for example, butterfly? And we look, when we look on the one side, what kind of changes we can do also in the area of these applications that are now discussed by the European Commission, they can all have the same effects or the same risk areas are relevant with these organisms. So um, that's very important to understand. So familiar, familiarity does not, not include, exclude risks. Next slide, please. Then there, of course, being a civil servant, sometimes lazy, we would also, of course, love to have lef, less work. <laughs> so it would be great if we would have a fast track to risk assessment and if we could per se say certain groups are less riskier. And we sit together with many colleagues from other European countries, uh, from Austria, from uh, Italy, and so on, and thought about all the other risk assessments. Can we have an easier way to do the risk assessment with these new applications? But we cannot. There are no um, um, characterizations that you can per se say, for example, this less risky. One example, history of safe use. That's a, a phrase that's connected to food production and not to the environment. There exists no history of safe use in the environment, first of all. Second of all, the instruments of genome editing do not have a history of safe use. So we cannot use this. Or could we use the level of interference? For example, if you have only changed one base pair or five base, pair, base pairs, is this less risky? No, it's not. You know from, from inherited illnesses that sometimes only one base pair change can make you heavily ill. So in our um, interpretation, there exists no pre, no, um, pre de denominators to exclude risk. You cannot do a per se risk assessment. Next slide. 
I was asked to also make a comment on uh, detection and identification. So um, just to, to explain or to order the discourse. So the detection, so that you can analyze if there has been a change in the genome. Therefore, we have um, the techniques. It's probably more a matter of money, how much you want to invest um, to sequence. For the identification, it's important that you know what you're looking at. And that's, there's no difference between the classical GMOs and the normal new GMOs we have here. You have to know what you're looking for. For example, if you have an apple gene in a banana, you will not see it from outside. If you don't know this imported banana has an apple gene inside, you will not find it. You have to know and look at it. Or we had the case in Europe that uh, a transgenic petunia, that's a flower, uh, had, had been um, uh, spreading uh, in the world. And there you could even see from outside that it is when you had the knowledge that this one is transgenic. But so you have to have knowledge. And for that, you need a database. And we are really um, trying to uh, negotiate on all levels that we have a good database. And in Europe, we have uh, the Eugenius database that I think we should use more and also the biosafety clearinghouse. So um, that, that has to be really brought forward. And the last point, uh, we have a research, pro research project on traceability. Uh, this is, of course, also an uh, invaluable instrument that is, could especially be used in GMO-free um, application. Next slide. I also like to uh, draw your attention that there's more on, horizon, more on the horizon uh, that is important for agriculture application too. Um, there we see that genome editing is also applied to viruses, to insects, to uh, um, um, animals. And these might have um, influence um, on agriculture protection, uh, agriculture produ production. But also there's a research on um, GMOs in wild populations uh, and in nature protection, uh, which uh, we just make, and I want to make a um, advertise our last um, position paper on um, uh, GM ab application and nature protection that have legal challenges, conceptual challenges, and risk assessment challenges. So to sum up, last slide. Um, from our point of view, is, um, we see the current legacy, uh, regulation as an opportunity to ensure the precautionary principle, to ensure coexistence for agriculture, as well as freedom of choice, um, and the necessity also to, to trust and tra state action so that really we as risk assessor really make a proper risk assessment and will be still in future be able to do it. So we really want to, and then I, we are not lazy, we really also want to in future do the risk assessment. Um, we do think that the current, current regulation is flexible enough, future proof and also the state of the art because it is flexible already. Uh, we do think there's research effort needed in this horizon scanning, what is going to come uh, in the development of tools to evaluate the impacts in the development of good detection methods uh, and the research on alternative paths. International, we really have to further work on um, a good register for genome edited organisms. And with this, I'd like to close. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Margaret, for raising all these important aspects on the risk assessment, but also on the importance of uh, traceability and, uh, and the obligation for, for applicants to provide information that allows for the identification of uh, GMOs that they want to put uh, on the market. So I, I very much hope that the BFN will have a chance to also uh, uh, present uh, these views to the European uh, Commission uh, as well, because if the Commission decides to move forward with a new legal framework. Uh, there are many aspects of a current legal framework that would clearly need to be incorporated huh, in a potential new legal framework. But as you, made, as you said very clearly, uh, on many aspects, the current legislation at the moment provide uh, this guarantee. So, so thank you very much. Uh, we thought it was very important to, to start uh, our, our day with um, 
shedding some light on some of its scientific aspects. So I want to thank our three panelists very much once again. And uh, now I hand over to Benny Helin again for the next panels on the economic impacts of new genetic engineering techniques um, with uh, quite a number of distinguished speakers. Over to you, Benny. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. The panel is um, filling, and this next uh, session is dedicated to the question of the economic impacts in the widest sense. It's not just winning or losing a little bit of money, but whether and how you can do your business, actually. Um, one participant, uh, Markus Weber from the Rewe Group, sent his apologies this morning. Unfortunately, there is an emergency. I hope it's not about a GMO in the shelves, <laughs> but uh, he, uh, he is involved in some kind of a recall operation. And uh, so I am very happy to have Tia uh, Lofts Garden, and I think. The idea we have is to start uh, with a hands-on report on how organic farming and trading and uh, consumption works when there are GMOs uh, on the neighboring uh, fields and when there is a rather loser GMO uh, regulation, as in Canada, Tia Lofsgaard is uh, working for the Canadian Organic uh, Trade Association and will, so to say, take us for a moment into the GMO country, Canada. Please, it's your turn. Thank you for coming. Hello, and thank you. Yeah. Okay. Hello, and thank you for uh, greeting me here today. Uh, so just to highlight that Canada is the fifth largest organic consuming nation, and we are your uh, 20th largest supplier for organic ingredients in, in the world. So it is uh, disheartening for me to have to say that Canada is a very strong leader also in GMOs. Uh, GMOs were introduced in 1990 in Canada, uh, where protocols were put in place to ensure traceability as well as health and safety protocols. Eight um, major crops have been approved since then, with the majority of them being canola, corn, soy, alfalfa, alpha, and sugar beet, uh, which we're seeing prolific uh, and dominating the marketplace, of course, in Canada. Uh, currently, we are going through uh, something very similar to yourself here in the EU, which is a proposed change, not to the regulation, but to the guidance document changing the definition of what would qualify as GE in Canada. And in that regard, we have been fighting this since May last year, last year and unfortunately it has gone ahead in one of the uh, regulations, which is under the Food and Drug Act, but we are still um, compelling our government to stop when it comes to the Feed and Seed Act. Uh, they are proposing not, of course, to um, change the regulation because they do not need to do an impact assessment. And unfortunately, the uh, limited scope of the plant breeders office within our Canadian Food Inspection Agency is not mandated to look at any unintended consequences to the marketplace and or uh, biodiversity. They are simply looking at health and safety. And from their conclusion, they have decided that there is no risks for health and safety for GE uh, products in Canada. So they are proposing to stop all mandatory health and safety assessments and allow GE products to come to market with no labeling, no assessments, and no knowledge or traceability, which is a huge risk, not only to the conventional sector, but specifically to the organic sector, because this is prohibited in our, all of our production techniques. Um, it is obviously something that we are fighting in a, in a huge way, and we have prior experience which we have been um, demonstrating to them that the risks are so grand for the organic sector, but as well to uh, the conventional sector. 
Um, when it comes to the experience that we have had in first hand of uh, GE and GMO crops that have uh, been introduced in Canada, I'm going to give you three specific examples. The first one started in 2004 um, when there was a legal legal issue, and you may have heard of it because this is a worldwide well-known case, Monsanto versus Percy Schmeiser. And this went all the way to the Supreme Court where Monsanto came onto this farmer's field, took a sample of his organic crop, found that there was contamination, sued him for uh, trademark infringement, uh, stating their patent rights, and it went all the way to the Supreme Court after many years where it ruled in the favor on Monsanto. It was a tight race, it was five to four vote, but the conclusion that is precedent setting is that the patent rights on a gene extend to the living organism in which it is found, and consequently, saving and planting seed containing a patented gene without the authorization from the patent holder is illegal. So this is the situation in which we are in now that is precedent setting. And it really opens up uh, the development um, of more GE patent infringement situations happening across the eight current approved G GMO and GE products. Um, of course, it is something that the GE companies are interested. They will gain royalties at $15 an acre was the calculation when it came to the Percy Schmeiser case. And uh, of course, we are concerned that contamination and drift um, is going to continue, especially if we have non-discernible GMO uh, coming to market beyond the eight that we currently have. In 2009, we had um, another escape. Uh, flax trifid, um, you may recall, uh, was discovered in exports in Western Europe. And this, uh, from the conventional side, uh, it used to be 65% of the exports um, of all of uh, Trifid or flax was coming to um, Europe. It w declined from 400,000 um, to three years later, it went down to 20,000. So it affected conventional um, exports, and organic shouldn't have been implicated in that, but of course, all exports were banned to Europe altogether. And still, um, we are seeing price drops that uh, resulted from that in organic premiums from an $11 to a bushel to $2 a bushel, despite this not being anything to do with organic. The last example I'll give you is in um, 2018, uh, we had a situation where GE wheat was discovered in a field. It was unapproved. We do not know why it was there. But essentially, um, it led to a ban of all wheat exports. And as you know, Canada is the world leader on wheat production. Uh, immediately, we were banned from Japan and Korea. Again, this should not have affected uh, organic, but of course, we were implicated as well. There were costs to the taxpayers, of course. Um, the land continues to be monitored to find out how they actually captured all of the escape. And of course, industry lost sales for quite some period of time, as well as damaging the reputation of Canada. Of course, um, what we are very concerned about is there is GE wheat available and approved in other jurisdictions. If the proposals go ahead in Canada, we could risk losing all of our wheat um, and our seed variety, which is um, a bigger issue. So the highlights of these risks that we are facing and that you would be facing if, um, if the proposals go ahead is your inability to trace and recall the cost of testing. Uh, farmers have to test for GE right now to try and make sure it's $350 a sample. And just with one farmer, over $500,000 a year he spends on GE testing. Of course, there's going to be higher risk of contamination. And farmers could purchase organic, or they could or purchase GE seed not knowing <laughs> because it's not going to be labeled and it's not going to be uh, traceable in any way. Um, so they would lose potentially their organic certification if they're buying any non-organic um, non and non-GE, or sorry, is GE seed or feed. Of course, they will lose their organic premiums and then have to wait the three years for organic certification again. 
So we value our partnership with the EU. We always find that you are our shining light for sustainability in agriculture. I come to you um, in peace and hope that we can all unite on this topic uh, to make sure that we stop what's happening in Canada and that we unite with the EU. You're a valued trading partner, and I think we can fight this together. Thank you. Thank you, Tia. And our next speaker is Heike Moldenhauer, and she is uh, representing ENGA, the European Non-GM Industry Association. And she will let us uh, know more about it in a minute. The floor is yours, Heike. Yes. Uh, ENGA, European Non-GMO Industry Association, is um, the name of uh, our organization. We are the EU representation of the conventional non-GMO um, sector in Brussels. The non-GMO sector is the response to the labeling gap under current EU GMO legislation. Only genetically modified feed is subject to GMO labeling, not related food products like milk, meat and eggs. The non-GMO sector that are companies that exclude genetically modified feed in their products and that use a non-GMO label. Non-GMO labeling is based on national laws and on industry agreements. A non-GMO label is used on a voluntary basis driven by supermarkets like Aldi, Carrefour, Lidl and Rewe who use it for their own brands for their private labels. The non um, GMO label is a reaction to consumer demand and a higher transparency standard than required by EU law. The largest markets are in Germany, in France and in Austria, with sales in Germany alone of more than 13 billion euros. Let me start with a quote from the retailer's resolution initiated by ENGA in 2021 and signed by conventional and organic supermarkets together. Under the heading, European retailers take a strong stand against deregulating new GMOs, it says, the significant increase of non-GMO products in supermarkets throughout Europe in recent years shows how transparency conforms to consumer preferences and demand. If the lobbying initiatives to lower these standards and low laws for new GMOs succeed, we as retailers would see our credibility, quality management systems throughout the value chain and commitment to transparency placed at risk. Our expanding organic and conventional non-GMO product lines would be under particular threat of damage or destruction." End of quote. This attitude is reflected in the food and retail sector's positioning in the public consultation on new genomic techniques recently published by the Commission regarding risk assessment requirements and transparency wire a physical label, the majority of organic and GMO-free operators, food retailers, and the food processing sector is in favor of maintaining the current regulation. The whole food sector, not only the non-GMO sector and the organic sector. The reasons for this position is, are evident. Most new GMOs will end up in food. The food and the retail sector is responsible and liable for all products it produces and sells. It depends on a thorough risk assessment. The food and the retail sector knows very well that a substantial amount of consumers has no demand for GMOs in food that GMOs don't sell. It depends on traceability and labeling requirements. And it would be the food and the retail sector that would be confronted with critical inquiries and anger of consumers should it come to a deregulation. A deregulation would mean, firstly, 
a loss of control over all feed and food value chains due, due to a lack of a GMO labeling. New GMOs can be present everywhere, not only in non-GMO and organic value chains. Second, a deregulation would mean loss of consumer trust. How to explain if a non-GMO product is contaminated with a new GMO? And how to explain that organic could be with GMOs? Thirdly, Massive setbacks in the conventional non-GMO sector with a threat of a full collapse. A non-GMO label is a very strong, a very explicit claim. It only makes sense if it is comprehensive and reliably can exclude old as well as new GMOs. Otherwise, it's meaningless. To conclude, the the European Commission, with its deregulation plans, endangers two booming food markets, the conventional and the organic non-GMO markets. Therefore, we advocate for remaining the current EU GMO legislation. Over to Jan Plage, who is the president of the biggest uh, German um, organic association, Bioland, and also of IFOAM EU, and uh, will tell us what the organic perspective is on this uh, new concept of uh, non-GMO GMOs. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Benny. And um, to all speakers uh, uh, who already um, uh, ex exchanged a lot of very important arguments and perspective on, on this important issue. Um, as president of IFOM Organics Europe and Bioland, I'm speaking here today to represent the European organic agriculture and food sector. For us, the decision on the future genetic engineering in the European Union may have far-reaching consequences for the organic and uh, GM, GMO-free agriculture and food production in Europe. In some of the future scenarios that are considered by the Commission, by DG Sante, key pillars that protect the organic supply chain would be dismantled, including risk assessment, labeling requirements and traceability procedures. Up to now, the precautionary principle has been a cornerstone of biosafety policies in Europe. Genetically modified varieties are only approved if, for example, a risk assessment covering health and environmental aspect has been passed. For us, ecosystem health is a key concern. And any medium and long-term risk of genome editing must be always um, uh, be examined on a case-by-case -case basis with comprehensive risk assessment and sci scientific evidence. This is as important for new genome technis, techniques as it is for the older generation of GMOs, since techniques like CRISPR-Cas allow deep changes in the genome that can affect plant metabolism processes, for example. Just one example, um, because uh, Benny said I, I have uh, one or two minutes more, because Markus is not here. Um, uh, one really um, important example of our breeding experiences, organic farmers. Um, uh, we, we are involved since 20, 30 years breeding and using and planting resistant varieties like um, uh, scarf uh, resistant, apple trees, paranospora resistant, wine um, uh, plants and, uh, for example, phytophthora resistant or tolerant potatoes. Uh, where our um, potato growers have a long lasting experience how fragile um, this uh, Phytophthora infestant tolerance or resistant genes are. We experience how quick a resistance um, uh, uh, can, can, can fail or if uh, resistant against the resi resistant by the pat pathogens um, can spread uh, in, in our uh, potato plants. So what we need 
and what we know together with all potato breeders in Europe is a um, resistant management. What we do, for example, in our Bioland potato growers groups, that we are very careful to use these important resistant varieties which we, which we achieve through uh, just classical conventional breedings. Um, I'm just uh, asking DG Sante and, and, and uh, Commission colleagues and the industry colleagues, how will you ensure a proper resistant management, what, what we really need on scientific evidence without risk assessment, without traceability? It's just not possible. It's uh, uh, like the uh, co colleague from BFN um, uh, said, uh, how will you make exemptions um, if you know on scientific evidence that it's crucial to have, for example, a resistant management system all over Europe. We also want to ensure freedom of choice for consumers. They should be able to decide for themselves whether, they, whether to buy GM, GM food or not. I'm talking to a lot of retailers all over Europe, and they are a bit scary to, um, uh, to discuss in, in, in rounds like this. Um, uh, on their opinions on, on, on GMO food, because they scare if uh, um, a product is labeled, this is uh, genetically modified or with genome editing produced, consumer will not buy it. Um, and, and, and that is um, the rea reality. At least 400,000 other EU citizens have signed a petition, a pe a petition to show their discontent with the possibility of exempting new genome techniques from EU strict genetic engineering legislation. Organic farming can offer consumers GMO-free produce and goods at the moment. With a potential deregulation, the consumer confidence and the integrity of the entire organic food supply chain is at stake. In other words, the freedom of choice for GMO-free cultivation and consumption in the EU would no longer be possible under a leg legislative framework that dismantles the currently existing safeguards. I want to highlight another important concern. Most scenarios for new re regulation outlined by the EU Commission not only question the precautionary pre principle, sorry, um, there could be even a sustainability label for plants which, with uh, NGTs, leading to a kind of greenwashing of these technologies. Promises of sustainability and food security have been exaggerated or misleading, as a scientist in part one of this session I have already explained. Every plant breeder knows how complex the genetic and physiological interactions are and that fertile and water retaining soils are at the heart of food security. And sometimes I'm, I'm asking myself of the Commission services um, still know what they are doing in certain um, um, different services. There are um, several services which work on sustainability labeling uh, uh, frameworks, which, which completely um, uh, describes many, many contradictions inside the farm to fork strategy to really change systems and not single technologies or some regulation. And it's important that only a holistic and ecological farming system can provide a good answer to the um, systemic problems, which are re really good described in the farm to fork strategy and the Green Deal. Organic farming is an ap appropriate farming system for the future because it addresses so many problems at once. The EU Commission is currently in the process of creating a huge conflict of goals inside of the farm to fork strategy. If it wants to expand GMO-free organic farming to 25% managed land by 2030, which is good and right, but at the same time it wants to abolish the basis for GMO-free agriculture within the EU with new regulations, this is a clear contradiction. With the one-sided focus of one new technology, we are once again heading for the next dead end, especially for us, for our, for our farmers all over Europe. Systemic problems must be answered with systemic solutions. To secure food for the people of our planet, we need a holistic, sustainable agriculture and food system that takes nature and the many interactions in our land use 
into account. Organic farming offers an ideal blueprint for achieving exactly this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jan. And I directly hand over to Fabrizio Fabri, who represents the European Community of Consumer Cooperatives, which is uh, actually an impressive part of uh, also the retail sector. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for, to the organizers for having inviting us to give uh, our perspective. What IRACOP represents, uh, we are in 19 countries across uh, Europe, not only EU. Um, we are, uh, they, they, the entire mass is set, it's about 7,000 cooperative enterprises uh, with 94,000 roughly point of sales across Europe employing uh, some 750,000 uh, people, employees. Um, and because of the cooperative nature, uh, this is governed by that directly by the members uh, who are uh, taking alive the cooperative and uh, complexly, so the COP system is owned by 30 million consumers members. Uh, with an annual, uh, total annual turnover of about 65 billion a year. Uh, EuroCOP, uh, as, as, uh, as regroupment of the uh, old COPs, is the second largest retailer uh, in e EU. What is a COPs position on GMOs? Uh, because of the nature of the COPs, which are governed by members, of course, the Fed, the consumers member, uh, of course, the first concern have been always to ensure transparency and ensure that uh, a, a strong regulation on G food and feed uh, uh, to provide uh, the right to choose choice uh, to consumers. Um, in many COP, uh, especially the largest COPs, uh, our members, they have set up their own G3 scheme and verification systems internally just to ensure that G3 labelled own products were in fact uh, as such. So they invested quite a lot of money. And it is of course COPs is, uh, uh, are strongly involved in promoting organic food and organic products, even through their own uh, organic food brand. Uh, the deregulation of NGTs will jeopardize both the G3 labeling uh, market, which is worth 10 billion, but I've heard that's probably more by the president of anger, uh, and uh, uh, the almost 45 billions for the 2020 uh, vote value of the organic market. Organic market. Uh, again, the organic matter is uh, two digits increasing. Uh, so uh, we uh, really are um, uh, concerned uh, by the fact that the Commission may be tempted to uh, please a part of the economic sector who is making pressure to deregulament uh, uh, NGTs, but losing the entire pictures because those two markets are going to be very heavily affected in any kind, in any deregulation. Uh, any deregulation should uh, happen. So we definitely have shared the opinion of the European Court of Justice. As a matter of fact, the new entities are GMOs. And we call the Commission to fill up, if there, are, if there is a need to fill up technical and legislative gaps that will allow entities to be recognized on the market and as, and as such, first tested and then labeled in order to give the consumer, um, keep the consumer the right to choose their food. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And the last speaker in this session is uh, Jörg Rohweda, who represents Foodwatch International, which is a, uh, an NGO-organized um, consumer organization now in a couple of EU member states. I should probably mention that uh, some of the um, 
facts that Christoph Ten had uh, presented earlier in his presentation have been presented uh, by the order or have been um, asked uh, to be presented by the VZBV. That is the rather state-organized uh, or consumer representation uh, in Germany. But we thought it is important to have a, a consumer representative who is uh, free to speak beyond uh, whatever state allows. And so I hand over to Jörg uh, for the last presentation. Go ahead. Ah, uh, mic is not on? Ah, uh, now it's on. Okay, cool, yeah. I was uh, thanking for having me and um, saying hello to everybody here in the room and online. Um, for those of you who do not know Foodwatch, um, we are a 20-year-old consumer organization, consumer rights organization with a focus on food and agriculture. We have 60,000 supporting members and reach out to 1.5 million followers throughout Europe. We have offices in Berlin, Amsterdam, Paris, Vienna, and a representation here in Brussels. Preparing for the panel, I try to understand, being new in this job, I'm executive director for a year now, but preparing for this panel, I try to understand what makes consumers so important, the perspective of consumers so important in this debate. Uh, and it was a journey into the past, I have to say. It was a journey back to 1962. And... Um, you all know the, the guy on the right-hand side, which is uh, JFK, and he introduced the Consumer Bill of Rights in a famous speech to the US Congress. But he did it on a draft written by Helen Nelson, a consumer rights activist. Nobody really know of her, I guess. And uh, when I tried to find an image of her in the internet, I couldn't find one. I only find one eulogy written in, in the year of her death in 2005, and I wrote to the author of the eulogy, and asked for an image, and there was none. So what I only present you is now the numbers of her, her um, the date of her birth and had, uh, when she died. And honestly, it bothers me. It bothers me that I do not know the whole story. And this is actually what we are talking about when consumers look into the GMO story, that we do not, or that we shall not know the whole story. And actually, we are interested in the whole story. So. The speech um, was um, so famous because it brought in the uh, consumer rights. And it took from 1962 until actually the Maastricht Treaty 1992 that the European Union also acknowledged that there, are, is, that there is something like the Consumer Bill of Rights. Um, the Consumer Bill of Rights stated when it was introduced um, four rights, the right to safety, the right to choice, the right to transparency, and the right to be heard. When you look now in, into the Maastricht Treaty and uh, the Article 169, then you find it in a similar way described, but not actually not the four rights described as they were uh, written down by um, Helen Nelson, but in, in the article it is described, oops, I was too fast here with the, it, was, it is described as the economic interests of uh, consumers. And I would say in a functioning marking, market, uh, the real interest of a, of a consumer is to have a choice, uh, and that the right to choice is now uh, for the European Union described as the economic interest of a consumer. There was a second development I would like to highlight here, uh, which um, made the uh, situation on con of consumers in the European Union more... Um, made it stronger, and, and that was the mad cow disease. You all might remember um, when it hit the European Union, then when it hit Europe and also um, North America, um, millions of cows uh, got slaughtered, and until now, 300 people died from that mad cow disease. But there was also a positive aftermath, and one of those is the good food law, which was introduced in 2005. And interesting for us from the consumer perspective is that the good food law also inscribed the precautionary principle as one of the main principles were transferred, and let's say, also to the, to the food sector, which is really important to us, that it is in, um, um, written down there as well. And it also introduced uh, traceability, which is one of the key 
instruments actually we are talking about here now to ensure that people, uh, consumers really have a choice when they um, go into the supermarket. Another wonderful aftermath of, um, uh, of the mad cow disease is actually the European Food Safety Authority. I don't know if you know that. For me, it was new, but uh, when it, uh, it was one of the direct results to introduce it. And um, I must say, I'm really happy that we have the European Food Safety o uh, Authority, even though I would be even more happy if they do what they are, um, or if they do better what they are for. Um, Looking into why is it so important, I also um, uh, find, okay, I'm, I, I can say I'm happy uh, about the legal situation, that the um, that, um, important rights are in the laws, in the European laws inscribed already, but what we also need to uh, use our freedom of choice um, is that we have a supply. This is so fast, this thing, I don't know why. <laughs> Um, that we uh, have a supply of goods to choose from. And what I heard today from the Canadian experience and on this panel uh, was like, okay, this is really endangered. So in the moment uh, food is contaminated with uh, GMOs and you cannot even see it from the outside, you have no label, you have no proof that there are uh, GMOs, then you actually do not have a freedom of choice anymore. Um, and the supply of goods to choose from today and also in the future is nothing you can talk about in the legal system, but it's in the material world. So it's, um, um, it's not only talking about the right, but it's also talking about the material world. And what we also need is information and knowledge. Um, what I found interesting, um, and it was described uh, already by Heike Moldenhauer a bit, um, that we have two different labeling um, systems right now. So we have the finished goods, and if you find any GMO in the finished good, or in, mainly it's uh, fodder where you find it in right now, then it has to be labeled. And um, I would say this is wonderful that we have already a system where you say, okay, it's, bio, it's um, GMO inside, and then you have to find a label. I, actually, I couldn't find a label from the European Union. I only uh, read in the regulation that, the, that you have to name it, but there's no label for it. And so I, I copy-pasted a label from the United States where they call it bioengineered. So it's not, don't look it up in the European Union. You will not find it. <laughs> Uh, and on the other hand, um, is uh, when you have uh, the process and the whole process is free of GMO, then you, like Heike Moldenhauer already described, are uh, able to say this is without GMO. Um, and um, as a re retailer, you guarantee that you will not find uh, GMO inside the whole process chain. And actually, this is... Um, the, um, to, to come to that, to come to a situation where you not only have, um, um, and, sorry, I let me continue on, on the other level and then I come back to that again. Um, what I also found interesting is that um, you not only need to have the different goods you have to choose from, but you also um, and you need to have a labeling uh, on products and on processes. Um, you have different reasons uh, for a person to decide whether to take it or not, whether to buy it or not. And um, uh, I found two main reasons, motivations for a, a consumer to decide on uh, whether you buy a product or not. One is science-based, where you really say, okay, um, I know it's science, and uh, the science... Um, tells me uh, there's a risk for my health, and uh, if there's a hazard for my health, I will not buy it, or there's a hazard for, um, for common goods, um, like biodiversity, um, like the soil, and I see, okay, there's a, the hazard I do not want to, to take, um, uh, I do not want to take by buying the food. food. Um, and there are actually uh, ethics we decide on. So we decide as a society what kind of uh, goods are actually those we want to have on our shelves and 
we, we are already agreed on, we do not want to have child labor or uh, slavery, and we do not want to have animal cruelty on our shelves, even though you can sometimes find it. And this is stuff we have to debate on. What I uh, want to emphasize here is that the other side, the, the opponents uh, or, the, or those who are interested in uh, deregulating the laws are, are only saying, hey, um, for your health, actually, there is no problem. If there is no problem for your health, then you do not need any labeling. And I would say, hey, no, that's wrong, because we have a lot of motivations for a consumer to decide on whether to buy a good or not. And um, we do not value what the motivation is. We just make sure that the, the motivation you have, you can um, exceed it, that you can make use of it, and you, that you can see okay, there's a product I, uh, with or without GMO, and this is easy for me to distinguish, and then I can take my decision. To conclude, um, we as a um, consumer rights organization, we demand more than uh, um, keeping the state of play. What we demand is actually full transparency on the product and on the process, so that whenever you buy um, a, a good, you can um, see easily that you, uh, if it is produced with GMO or not. And that is actually simple. We have traceability. It doesn't cost much. Uh, everybody knows what they are using. So uh, it's actually quite um, inexpensive to, to establish this as a whole process for the European Union. You could have a simple logo. Uh, on-off logo, let's say, with or without logo, simple color coding, no score needed, simply green or red, and then you know what you are buying. And therefore, we are going beyond um, what is called now in a lot of uh, petitions and um, uh, demands, political demands, um, not keeping only the state of play, but improving it to a better system. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Jörg. I think we had a rich diversity of uh, perspectives. Um, and we are now uh, getting ready for uh, the debate. But before the debate comes, we have a break. And uh, I hope you will all enjoy the coffee. And um, you will enjoy meeting people again that you haven't seen for a while. And we will start here again at noon sharp. Uh, so yeah, enjoy the coffee and see you in a little more than 20 minutes.
Ladies and gentlemen, can you please take your seats? Ah, uh, here. <laughs> I have to say, I never had such a such a nice coffee break ever in the European Parliament as this one, with all these nice little um, uh, uh, snacks. And I want to thank Viola and the rest of the gang from Sarah Wiener's uh, team, who have prepared this out of their pockets. The catering guy. <laughs> <laughs> and it comes from Zaravina's uh, farm, and it's all organic, and um, we'll, we'll eat all the rest after this session. <laughs> and now, ah, hello, uh, and now it's my pleasure to introduce you all to, well, the main speaker is still... Coming. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Hello. Hello. Hi, nice Very to meet you. Pleased to meet you. Thank you. Righty-ho. We have a short hour left to discuss and digest. And uh, we are especially grateful that uh, Claire Burry, the deputy, um, um, how do you call it, sorry, <laughs> director <laughs> general, uh, the deputy director general of DG Santé, who is preparing the dossier about the uh, uh, new GMO legislation, uh, will introduce us to her plans. And we have a full podium of uh, interventions, questions to the commission, uh, positions. And this is not even all. We have more people uh, in the first row here who will come up. And I'm asking those who have spoken to uh, move down and make, make room for their uh, successors. And now, without further delay, over to Claire Burry. What are these plans you have? <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm here uh, this morning, and it's great uh, to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. I hope the Commission will be up to the task when you start pummeling us with the questions afterwards. <laughs> Um, but we'll do our best. Um, and Irene has been following already uh, online this morning. I'm here with Irene Sakastan. Most of you probably already know her. Uh, she's the um, key lady on this file, I would say. Uh, but just a few words of, of introduction, because you said, what, you know, what are you up to? What's the commission doing? It's not my plan. You know? I mean, I don't think Ursula would be very happy to hear that now. But anyway, so what, what's happened so far is that um, in September, uh, President von der Leyen, in the State of the Union address, said that there would be a legislative proposal on plants produced by new genomic techniques in the initiatives for next year. So, of course, that means the starting gun has been fired. Um, obviously, uh, we have been working uh, and trying to understand these new techniques for, for some time now, and most of you probably be following the beginning part of the story before Ursula made her uh, announcement. I want to be very clear on one thing before I start talking about what uh, we might be trying to do there and what might be in it, and what the context is and what you might think about it, which is to say that we don't propose to overhaul the existing GMO legislation. We are not going to do that. I don't think it's the right time to do it. I don't think um, it will be the right thing to do. Um, so it's not that. We're looking at um, plants obtained by targeted mutagenesis and cisgenesis and what might be done with them. So what's the objective, first of all? Um, the first thing is we've got to follow all our usual better regulation guidelines, and we will do that here uh, carefully. Uh, we've consulted. There's been public consultations. There are meetings that are going on. Uh, there is impact assessment work that is being uh, prepared. 
And I think what we have so far, and I don't want to overstate the case on this, but I think we have some evidence uh, that the new genomic techniques could support sustainability. Now, the question is, okay, fine, but what does that mean? So we'll, let's see and let's debate a bit around that. Huh? Um, what have we seen so far that the, in the product pipeline, there are a wide variety of cereals, fruits, and vegetables uh, that can bring benefits for health, wheat uh, with reduced gluten content. Maybe you'd like to take the floor already, no? <laughs> um, with reduced um, gluten content, uh, for the environment, we've got uh, virus-resistant sugar beets that can reduce the use of insecticides, climate change rice that's uh, tolerant to drought and salt, and food security, which is obviously a key issue at the moment. And that, I would say, is one of the things that's raising the pressure a bit to come with this new framework. But obviously, these NGTs, we don't think it's going to be a silver bullet. It's not a full answer. And whatever we do has to be of benefit to society um, and the environment. So... What might be in the policy initiative? And here I'm giving you a little bit of um, a, an insight. I can't tell you exactly because I don't know, because you know, it's still in the making. Uh, but what kind of things would it cover? So from our perspective, the risk assessment and the approval requirements need to be proportionate to risk. I don't think that's new to anybody in this room. You very well know uh, how we do risk and how we do the precautionary principle. Um, and these techniques are not all the same. Uh, they are quite different in places. Um, and I, I don't think that a one-size-fits-all regulatory response uh, will be the answer. We need to obviously work on what EFSA have done. And I think you've seen, and I know it's been debated this morning, uh, the recently published updated uh, opinion. Um, and a statement on criteria for risk assessment. And, and I understand this morning there was a question about uh, what EFSA has done on unintended consequences. And there I think we can say that EFSA has looked at this, um, and Irene can give chapter and verse on that um, in terms of what's been looked at so far. So let's be clear about what the situation is. Let's base our discussion on the facts. Um, and we're also looking at whether there would be a possibility to incentivize uh, traits which are linked to sustainability, because this is all part of what we're doing on the Green Deal uh, and the Farm to Fork strategy and, and sustainability. Um, and a lot of you work on that already and have a clear idea and are contributing to that. Huh? Um, and last but by no means least, we want appropriate traceability and information provisions. Everybody says transparency is key. Fine. What does that mean in practice? It's crucial for the organics industry. Where's Eric? I've lost him now. But anyway, we had a discussion about this last week. Um, but it's not just important for the organic and the GM sectors, but also it's about freedom of choice. And I want to be categorical on that. Huh? Some people may want to use these technologies, and others may not. And we need to be able to allow them to exercise choice. So just to finish, a couple of words of context. And I was just discussing this with one of the uh, colleagues here in the room about what consumers want and what they know. I, I think one thing, um, we may have differences of view about what should be done from a regulatory perspective, but I think there's one thing we will agree on, which is that people need to have information to be able to make choices. So part of what we do here, and what I trust you will do in the process, is um, try and make sure that we get the information out, we share information, um, and we open the opportunity for engagement uh, with consumers. There are different views on the risk assessment on sustainability and information, but we will come forward with the proposal which is based on science. Of course, not all scientists agree, I have learned. As a lawyer, I know that not all lawyers agree, but I also know now that not all scientists agree. Uh, but we will look at the best science that we have out there. We'll look at what EFSA uh, comes up with. And we count on all of you for an open and constructive debate, regardless of what the different views are. And I respect those views. And I want to listen to what you have to say this morning and respond where we can. One of our strengths in Europe is diversity. I won't go back to that 
Schumann motto, but um, having diversity is part of what Europe's about. So from our perspective, we think organic, agroecology and biotechnology are important pieces of that diversity and there's no one size uh, fits all. So I'll finish on that because I can see that some of you are already impatient uh, to respond to what I've said. Um, I'm not here to preach, I'm here to listen and to answer where we can. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Buri, and thank you for staying with us. Um, and uh, the first uh, response you will get is from uh, Sarah Wiener on our very left. Um, she bought that slot with a nice food we, she brought. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, schön, dass ich hier sein darf. Vielen Well, it's nice to be here. I'm going to be speaking Austrian because we are in the European Parliament and should be using uh, linguistic diversity and promoting that. I would like to focus on one particular element, herbicide tolerance, which tends to go hand in hand with GMO. I'm going to keep my comments very brief, but let me just say that I've been looking at who is here and who's listening in. As you know, in the European Parliament, we think this is a very important conversation. You've had, heard some fascinating presentations. And as far as I can tell, rather frustratingly, we don't have anyone from the conservative groupings. Am I in error there? Is there anyone from the conservative political parties? No, no one. And so I'm not sure whether industry having dialed in is seeking to learn or whether you're just trying to work out how you can counter our arguments, although it is good to see you online all the same. Now, herbicide tolerance, this is a massive issue. The European Institute carried out an assessment of the market for new gene technologies and techniques and plant applications and found that 17 plant applications included n nine herbicide tolerance things. So we're not focusing on creating climate resistant plants but we're l thinking about herbicide tolerant plants so as to be able to use herbicides if you look back over the history from the various um, co companies that were involved with gmo seeds and all the different inputs that is where we saw billions beginning to pour into the coffers of those companies. We now have five major companies which account for 60% of Gopal. So we've seen a lot of herbicide resistant weeds. So I don't know whether we're going to be able to outperform nature. I don't know whether we're going to be able to come up with a technical solution. I think we're kidding ourselves because nature always fights back. There are now weeds, super weeds. There are things that are 2.5 meters high. You see them in the soya fields in the US. You see a lot of resistance. And that means that we need even more pesticides so as to overcome these problems. And the large corporations have now reached agreements on how to tackle resistance issue. And what we're doing is we're bundling up our toxic agricultural product. And perhaps in the next few years, we will be able to have some kind of safety measures and applications that will avoid this. But th at the moment we have a treatment that isn't really a solution. It's not for a healthy and sustainable future. So what we need to do is comply with existing legislation. We need to work with agroeconomic systems rather than coming up with a complicated 
living chain where we have to look at each element in the chain and come up with a solution. One last concluding remark. Gene technology and GMO is currently 0.03% of biodiversity. So let's just bear that in mind. Thank you. Thank you. I have to apologise, Muta. Madam Rivezi is going to have to leave very soon, and so she has asked whether she could take the next slot. So, Madam Rivezi. Thank you very much, and thank you for organising this meeting. This is, after all, a very serious topic, an extremely important one, too, because it doesn't focus just on GMOs, it, it addresses the whole issue of what might be regarded as objective science. You will know that the Greens commissioned a report on this issue, and you know the usual uh, lobby groups applied pressure to the Commission. That happens to some extent at Parliament too, but it's above all at the Commission that this happens, as they seek to call this legislation into question. In 2018 in particular, the Court of Justice of the European Union ruled that uh, new GMOs are covered by EU legislation on GMOs and are subject to the same uh, safety uh, scanning and labelling requirements as any other GMO subject. Now, as far as we were concerned, that was a, a serious act. We had the labelling for the benefit of consumers, and at the same time we had risk assessments attached to this. At this point, we've been weighing up who these pressure groups are. There are the usual culprits, the industry... Well, they're doing their job. Europe, yeah. Euroseed, and we know BASF, and by our, uh, all the rest of them are, are in the background. But the issue now is the scientists involved. Who are these scientists? When we assessed this, we found that many of the scientists are calling for deregulation of GMOs and actually have conflicts of interest. OK, they, they may have positions at university, but in order to carry out their research, they sign contracts with industry, and they end up lodging patents for these new GMOs. So these scientists are a false scientist, or at least they're scientists with interests in the industry. There's a terrible conflict here. Science is actually being taken over by the industry. Now, here people are saying we're in favour of biodiversity, we're pro-innovation. Yes, but to what end? But people say to you, look at the research being carried out. They're not items of research for the general interest. It's not research for consumers. As a biologist, you have to ask, what about traceability? What about the impact on the environment? ecosystems. What are the long-term consequences for health? We've no answers to those questions. So we have to be extremely vigilant and we must constantly call for the scientists to list their interests. We cannot allow science to be captured by the industry. That's the message I want to leave with you. So there can't be any question of undermining this regulation that we've built up with, with the backing of uh, European case law. We don't have to give way to the Commission, which is under pressure from the lobbies. They're, they're capable of accepting anything. No, we in the Greens are saying, no, our existing regulation is fine, let's keep it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madame Ribasi, and uh, over to Mutuship from Friends of the Earth Europe. Hello, thanks for the invitation and the opportunity to speak. Friends of Europe is the biggest grassroots environmental federation in Europe, and we work on this topic for decades, and also me, I work for it quite a long. So whilst we are meeting here today, various of our colleagues, and I think ministers from nearly every country on this planet, are living in Sharm El Sheikh to discuss at UN level on the climate COP. And also here in Europe, we experienced now with fires, with the hottest summer since the beginning of weather recording in a lot of countries, we had floods in Belgium. Pakistani people lost everything because one third of the country was underwater. So climate change is happening. We have a real climate crisis. 
And similar things are happening on biodiversity. We lose ecosystems in a space that is unimaginable. And then we hear now from Sante, yes, we have a magic solution. We have products in the pipeline of biotech companies, of startups, of researchers that will fix all these problems. And I know we had other crises, so the Fridays of Future movement is getting less media attention, but we don't have time to lose, to wait, that maybe in 15 years one of his product could deliver anything. We need to act now, and we have a solution. We heard in the morning very clearly from Dr. Gelinski that it's too clump complex to rely on CRISPR-Cas, that they would deliver a plant that could cope first with a drought in early spring and then with a flood in summer to give any income for farmers. So maybe we are ready one day, but not now. But we have solutions that work. We have real food system that work. We have agroecology practices that can deliver. They protect biodiversity. They increase soil health. We have organic farming that really is good to reduce pesticides to zero. So we have systems in place. They can adapt to extreme weather conditions. They reduce climate gas emissions. But what do we hear from the Commission? Let's hope on our technology fix that we get there. And I'm following EU legislation for quite a while, and actually, what I can remember, this is the most biased thing I've ever seen on the table from the Commission. Because if you compare what Euroseeds, the lobby organization of the big biotech companies, is demanding, it's one-to-one -one what the Commission wants. One-to-one. -one. They redefine the definition, what is a GMO, what is not a GMO, but what they're really keen on, they want to avoid labeling. Because as we learned in the panel before, as long GMOs are labeled, Consumers don't buy them, and retailers are very reluctant to sell them. And this is the situation now. GM food is authorized in Europe at this moment, but nobody wants to buy it, so it's a marketed consumer rejection on it. And since 2020, I can't remember. I think I took part in five leg consultations. I had five meetings with commissioners, more meetings with cabinets. We wrote, I don't know, five, six letters signing 80 organizations, including farmers' organizations, consumers' groups, and whatever, saying what we need from the commission is keep the legislation in place. Nature needs it, citizen needs it, farmers need it. But what have you seen from the commission? Zero. Zero. So, Mr. Brewery, my question to you, Mrs. Brewery, my question to you, can you give me one example, only one, where you have taken up any of these concerns, any of these clear demands. So 66,000 citizens called in autumn 21 to keep GMOs legislated, keep them labeled, give transparency for farmers and consumers. What was your reaction in the next consultation that you did in summer 2020? There was not even a box that you could tick that you want to keep new GMOs labeled as GMOs on the product. What you offer instead is replace a, well introduced GMO labeling scheme, you think loudly about it in your kept sacred policy options that normal people could not access, citizens could not access, um, to replace GMO labeling scheme with a sustainability labeling. This is so absurd that it's really hard to imagine. So if you have a plant that might deliver for a certain period a resistant to a plant pest, you want to put on the product a label that it's sustainable, Sorry, this is really outrageous. So sitting here on the panel, I lost my confidence that we would get ever anything acceptable from the Commission, so only all our hope is now in the European Parliament. We worked with the European Parliament in the past quite well, when the Commission wanted to open all fields for the current GMOs, and the Parliament stopped this attempt, so now they are banned in 70 member states. We need from a Parliament, from all committees, a strong message. GMOs will be kept labelled as GMOs on the final product. This is what farmers need, and this this is what consumers need, and this is what also the environment needs, because we don't know, we are not gambling with nature on plants that are so new that they got a, a Nobel Prize award for it two years ago, and you believe scientists or some EFSA myths that they are as safe as conventional. This is irresponsible, and we really want to hear from MEPs now that you stand up, that we keep a labeling scheme, because from the Commission, after two years, I don't know how many months I spent with meetings, shared reports about climate, about pesticide reduction, and all is dismissed for two and a half years. Okay. So this is what we need from the parliament. Thank you. And you... <laughs> Mrs. Bury needs to respond immediately.
<laughs> okay, thank you, Benny, uh, for not having me frustrated there. Um, maybe, uh, and I promise to be short, so I will. Um, first of all, in relation to um, Mrs. Vina, I, I would like to thank her for the work that she's doing on the sustainable use uh, regulation. Um, thank you very much uh, for uh, your rapporteurship on that and your involvement on the sustainable use. Uh, we really appreciate that, um, and we want to work very constructively with you, with you on that. You mentioned herbicide tolerance. And I think it's a very important point that you raise there, no? Um, and it goes back to what I was saying at the beginning, which is um, we need to keep society and the environment at the middle of everything that we do on this. And using technology to do things like herbicide tolerance is, is I think, questionable. Let's put it that way, no? I think it's questionable. So I fully understand where you're coming from on that. Um, and we do... we. We do keep that example in mind in the Commission. It's very much at the forefront of our minds. Um, so if I may now, in relation to, to Muta, um, you are very eloquent, and I would like to take you to discuss with the Member States, because I would like to put you in the situation that I had last night, from 9.30 till 11 o'clock, uh, on the sustainable use of pesticides, where we tried to explain the impact on the climate and biodiversity of the continued use of chemical pesticides. But it's quite difficult to get that message through sometimes. So please, you're welcome to come and, and help with that. Huh? I really need you, we need you on that file um, to get member states to understand the urgency of it because they are dragging their feet not really aware of the fact that, um, you know, things are moving on. Um, this parliament, the mandate of this parliament will change. There will be elections. And we need to move before that, I would say. Yeah? So, please, um, I understand what your point of view is, but the Commission is also in the trenches on this with you fighting. So, um, now, I come to what you were saying about... <coughs> labeling and I said it at the beginning I think the labeling issue is a difficult one and I also said there needs to be transparency and consumers need to make choices so we will factor that in to what we do and last if I may to close uh, Irene tells me that there were boxes in the consultation so let's base things on the facts please but I'm happy to discuss, well, I'm not sure it's good to, dis to dispute that on a panel. I think we've got bigger things to discuss, but we can certainly uh, talk about that and, and, and see what you think the problem was. Thank you. But Thank my you question to you was, what do you take up from all these demands in your new proposals? Okay, that will be for the next answer uh, that we will have now. First for um, Maria Arena from the Socialist Group. Merci beaucoup, je vais parler en français. Thank you. I'll speak French. It's easier for me to get across my point of view in my mother tongue. By way of reply to what was said just now by the Commission representative, clearly the Commission's position, particularly in the instance of pesticides, is not a, a simple position. Having had to deal with this issue of pesticides on behalf of the S&D group, we do have full understanding of the position of the Member States. Work has to be done at every level, nationally as well as at the European level, if we're to attain the goals we have before us. Now, it's true that sometimes the Commission does come under attack for its proposals. Far be it from us to imagine that the Commission's position is a simple one. When it comes to persuading various Member States of the case for pressing ahead. Now, switching to genome techniques, the initiative came from the Commission. Although we have GMO regulations today, so why would the Commission take an initiative when we already have regulation? What I really cannot understand is that the Commission is exposing itself to uh, uh, proposals such as this in the eyes of the Member States. With the existing regulation, I stick to the view there was no need for an initiative on this from the Commission. 
So the question in our mind is, why did the Commission take this initiative? Now, perhaps I will seem a, a little blunt, but Michelle Vivazzi touched on this point. She said there is an in industrial lobby out there today working on the Commission. And when you look at what's behind that industrial lobby, there was a reference to Monsanto a little while ago. You know, if you give Monsanto the keys to solving the issue of climate change and sustainable development, or addressing food security for a growing population, it's as if you were handing over your, your child to a paedophile to get them to look after it. Sorry, but uh, I really find this rather awkward. Sorry, but if you call upon a firm which itself is part of the cycle leading to the destruction of biodiversity, releasing products onto the market which lead to the climate being destroyed, I'm sorry, but I just can't see things in that light. So whether it's Monsanto or any other of these, these firms lobbying, these are people you really have to, to keep at arm's length from any change to the regulation, which means there have to be obstacles. There has to be a colon sanitaire. As far as I'm concerned, that's what we need. Dealing with firms like that is a colon sanitaire. We must not allow our positions to be poisoned by professors from those firms. Now, there are proposals on climate change now and on biodiversity as well as food security. I actually talk about food sovereignty rather than, than food security. And turning to those firms is not the way you find a solution. What I've heard today, be it from scientists or from those who've spoken about the economic impact of all this, merely serve to strengthen my position that we do not need the Commission's proposal today on these genome techniques. And that is the case we will try to win in this Parliament. Thank you. Thank you very much. Aina Bartmann next to me is representing uh, uh, the Norwegian GMO group and uh, the particularity about it is that this is not just the ones who are against GMOs but there is a consensus well beyond this, and we'll hear from Norway uh, how you are dealing uh, with the challenges we are discussing today. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for inviting us. The Nordic countries have a long history of close collaboration, including farming and local food traditions. And in the new Nordic Food Manifesto that was published in 2004, the first goal is to express the purity, the freshness, the simplicity and the ethics we want to associate with our region. How does GMO fit into this vision? According to several surveys, the majority of Nordic citizens are very critical and want all GMOs to be regulated. And since 2019, many organizations from civil society have worked together in what we call the Nordic GMO network. We are different organizations with different opinions on the possible benefits of future GMOs. But we all support the ruling by the European Court Justice in 2018. All GMOs, including gene-edited organisms, must be risk assessed and monitored. And if a GMO is approved, it must be traceable and labelled. And this is our minimum demand and must be cornerstones in any future legislation. The Nordic GMO network also underlines that future regulation must take into account the rapid development within gene technology. Gene drives is one example of reckless use of GMOs, but gene ed editing direct in the field, like with the RNAi spray, and other examples of gene modification outside the laboratories, shows that we need a wide definition of GMOs and that they must be risk assessed, 
case by case. And with cheaper and more accessible methods for gene modification, the scope of use and the pace of release GMOs will in itself represent a new type of risk that we have not seen before. And the ECG ruling allows us to balance the need for research and innovation and the need to keep a high level of protection for health and environment. And only by regulating GMOs are we able to say yes to the products we want, if we want any. For instance, uh, products that could contribute to sustainable development and no to the products we do not want. And Coming from Norway, where sustainability is a key requirement in our Gene Technology Act, it is very important for me to say sustainability can never be reduced to a question about single traits in a plant or an animal. Sustainability is about environmental, economic and social justice in a global perspective. We need fundamental changes in our food systems if we're going to achieve food sovereignty, protect biodiversity and stop climate change. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Pascal Durand is from the Renew Group and uh, will um, give us uh, an additional perspective on the topic. I understand in your group there are a couple of views on this, <laughs> and uh, we will hear from you. Thank you. Uh, uh, I can express me in French? Yes, it's... Yeah, okay. Merci, merci beaucoup. Well, thank you very much. I have to say, I, I hate having to do what I'm about to do this. Maria, I don't, I'm not grateful to you for put me in this position. I don't like this. I've arrived late on the panel, but it was for good reason. We were voting on a gender equality text on gender equality in companies that's been stuck in Parliament for 10 years, which was also an important feature of a more sustainable and fairer world. And that fits in with our vision. I don't want to take too long, not least in light of all the people who've already spoken, and unfortunately I wasn't able to hear their comments. I can tell you that the Renew Group is very much divided, so I'm not speaking on behalf of the Renew Group, not least because I don't have a mandate to do so. I wouldn't want to have to do that. So I'm not talking on behalf of my group. When I'm talking about this, I am speaking personally as an environmentalist. My position is well known, it's very clear. My view is that there is no place for commercialization of the world without controls. It's pretty clear. So every time that we manipulate living entities, every time that we attack natural evolution, we need to do so subject to very rigorous checks and controls. We need to think very carefully about the precautionary principle in all of those activities. Now, I think the, m the most dangerous feature, I said this at the time of the GMO debate, but I will repeat it now. So the big debate is not really about the scientific and medical issue. We're talking about justice and environmental issues and the privatization of living entities. So we're giving industrial companies control over our food supply and farming around the world. And that is a an overturning of our civilization for thousands of years. We have been working for the common good. We have treated the natural world as a common resource, but we're now destroying that approach in the name of money, in the name of overproduction, in the name of unbridled growth. And I can tell you that we will 
always be accused of being opposed to science, but actually we are the great defenders of humanity and of these principles. We're very aware of what we're going to be bequeathing to future generations, including our own children. So that's what I have to say. I have to say that the position adopted by part of my group, and I imagine this is similar in the socialists and democrats, group, although the Greens are remaining united on this, for which I'm very grateful. But within the Renew group, I can tell you that we are a minority in fighting for the precautionary principles and the principles of sustainability and justice, which is what this Parliament stands for. Thank you. Thank you so much. We've all started as a minority. and. Uh, <laughs> So <laughs> don't give up. The next speaker is, um, is Pat Thomas from uh, the UK, and she will give us a taste of how deregulation looks in the UK. And uh, over to you. Thank you, Benny. Uh, I suppose I should preface my remarks by saying that although the UK is no longer part of the European Union, we are inarguably part of the fabric of Europe. And what we do affects you and what you do affects us. It's absolutely no secret that the UK has made some very bad political decisions recently. Um, the draft genetic technology precision breeding bill is just one of them. Written with one beneficiary in mind, the biotech industry, it fails to recognize the intersection of agricultural biotech with multiple other areas of food production, health, social justice, and environment. Unpopular with our citizens, it relies on legally and scientifically vague language and a near mythical PR narrative of the GMO that could have occurred naturally. It quietly deregulates not just these mythical GMOs, but most types of GMOs. And it's dangerous because like all bad political decisions, it is the product of short-term thinking, disdain for citizen views, and a failure to understand the consequences of its central proposition. Genetic engineering technologies are evolving quickly and proposed uses extend well beyond the historical handful of commodity crops into every corner of agriculture, food production, and the wider environment, to horticulture, cover crops, and sea vegetables, to land-based livestock and aquaculture, to re-engineering farmed insects for food and feed, as well as vital pollinators to better withstand higher pesticide applications, to gene-edited microorganisms to coat our seeds with biological pesticides and inject our soil with plant growth promoters, to synthetic biology, the extreme re-engineering of bacteria, algae, and yeasts to produce substances they would normally never produce, to man-made DNA, written on computers and used to create organisms that have never before existed and whose impact on nature is unknown, to biological labeling made up of synthetic or re-engineered DNA and put into farmed products to trace them through the food system, to RNAi sprays used in the field to switch genes on and off at will, to gene drives, turning fields into laboratories, spreading genetic modifications quickly through plants, animals, and insects, in the open environment, and finally, to the use of all of these technologies in wild nature as tools of conservation to re-engineer the living landscape. This is the overwhelming big picture of the deregulatory pathway, blurring the lines between nature and technology with inevitable negative consequences for farming, the environment, culture, and our citizens, but also for the biotech industry, because deregulation risks the boom and bust of an industry so overwhelmed by its own creations, most of which will never find a route to market, that it will crumble under the weight of its own ambitions. If the EU follows this pathway of short-termism and ignoring the consequences, it will be an active participant in all of these failures. And so I urge you, as you can contemplate regulatory reform, to ensure that the principles of legitimate legislation, foresight, precaution, democracy, these are words that have meaning, ensure that these foundational principles in the European Union are guiding your every decision. Thank you.
Let's move on to Benoit Bito. D'abord, merci beaucoup de. First of all, thank you very much for organizing this event and inviting me to give my views here. Thank you for proposing this exchange of views. Now, you may be surprised to hear me say this, but I draw some reassurance from some of the points I've heard this morning, insofar as we have mainly women speakers at the top table today, and we, we've seen that they, they tend to be more aware of um, these issues rather than uh, Mrs. Thatcher. But anyway, I'm reassured to, to see women grappling with these issues. Then. Let's see things in context. At what point is this proposal for a revision of the text coming through? Well, there's, there's a terrible state of affairs here. There's rare cynicism here. We see that against the backdrop of the geopolitical crisis in Ukraine, the drought and climate change, the, the usual suspects are once again asking us to go further as on loosening up reach. They want us to loosen up regulation here. They're using that geopolitical context to get GMO regulation to change. I think that's absolutely cynical and indecent. Einstein said you can't solve with the, the people who have caused the problems. Uh, if we have this problem, the collapse of biodiversity, food security and climate change, it's precisely because of the techniques, methods and line of thinking of these people who are asking us to change the regulation today. Einstein said it's not with the people who cause the problems that you can find the solutions. So I echo what my colleague has said, absolutely. Our starting point has to be the leave those people behind in the 20th century. If, if we're going to think about new regulation, if we need it at all, do we actually need anything new? Now, madam, you seem to be keen on trans transparency, biodiversity, uh, climate and health. So we. Let me give you my background. I'm a peasant farmer, madam, and I can assure you that all the topics that you seem concerned about, having transparency, um, food quality and safety, etc. All these are issues that small farmers have been working on for ages. And they have a, an answer to this problem. And that is not GMOs. It's, we have ecotypes that can give us genetic independence for our small farmers. You, you worry about farmers' incomes. Well, these are the practices that, that mean that because they no longer depend on seeds, from the big seed firms, they are actually able to turn a profit again on their farms. So it's 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 a black and white vision here. Breaking out of this vicious circle of these people who've been holding the reins for all too long, we're avoiding allowing them to put forward solutions to us any longer. So. That's my problem. I'd, I'd, I'd like to quote Gandhi, as I've mentioned, small farmers. He said, showing an example, it's not just one way of persuading people, it's the only way. Scientific attractivity. I, I've carried out research on GMOs. I, I, I know that the people involved here, they don't have an overall approach. They don't have any long-term or holistic vision. All they're interested in is turning a quick profit. Now, as an MP, you have to uphold the common interest. You have to ensure we have public policies geared towards the general good. And I want to assure you that the, the proposals here would um, rush us to um, the end of the process. No, let's let's work towards our, our goals rather than, than theirs. On the 14th of December, I'm going to be attending the um, the court case in, in Dijon of farmers who've, who've had proceedings opened against them for involuntarily using patented seed. Please join me. This reg regulation must not change. It, it must stay on the statute books, as Jesus Michel Rivasi was saying. 
We need a long-term overall vision. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Benoit. You've been speaking for at least two men on the uh, <laughs> panel. And I hand over uh, to our uh, last intervenant, uh, Nina Holland from Corporate Europe Observatory. Thanks very much, Benny, and thanks for uh, having me on this panel. Uh, being the last speaker, it's uh, it's challenging. Um, um, I'm from Corporate Europe Observatory, a lobby watchdog organization based here in Brussels. So I have the the pleasure for a number of years to read all these documents that industry sends to uh, decision makers, notably the European Commission, uh, to push for deregulation of uh, new um, GM technologies. And uh, let's be very clear, I think it's been very clear from the different speakers, this is a case of undoing environmental and food safety regulation. This is a, a, a deregulation proposal that does not serve the European Green Deal uh, or any uh, food safety purpose. It's clear who will benefit. Uh, Bayer and Syngenta alone combined already dominate 40% of the commercial seed market. And deregulation in combination with patents uh, will only increase this market domination and will only increase uh, the, the problematic effect that they will basically decide what farmers can grow and what uh, breeders can breed. Uh, and it's one, one really big mistake that the European Commission is making by not taking that uh, into account, not factoring that in. Now we are in uh, a situation where we have big battles, where the European Commission is proposing a drastic cut of pesticides, which we welcome very much. Uh, this leads to even stronger pressure from the industry um, to deregulate new GMOs, so that can make up for the part of the expected losses from the pesticide business. Um, as Ms. Arena has very clearly said, we cannot rely on uh, any uh, genuinity uh, of claims of, of sustainability by these corporations, Farm Format. They, they don't have the track record. They sell, uh, they have one third, uh, around one third of their profits from pesticides is from the highly hazardous pesticides, and they even want to keep exporting them around the globe. Uh, so they really have no intention to uh, really change their business. And increasingly, we, what we see is that in this avalanche of lobby events that we're seeing today, uh, they are more and more hiding behind uh, the, the lobbyist scientist platforms that Ms. Rivasi was uh, referring to, like EU SAGE, which was set up by the Flemish Biotechnology Institute, which itself has Bayer and Basef on the board. So there's a great uh, collaboration, integration there. Uh, you also have the European Plant Science Organization that organizes these uh, meetings with, with officials from like-minded ministries trying to already create uh, a critical mass in order to prepare for uh, a deregulation. Um, and as a result, the, 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 the process seems to be really captured by these interests. Uh, some of the biggest uh, flaws that I would like to stress again, part have already been mentioned, is the, the biased nature of consultation. Uh, the one done for the study where uh, the Commission did a, a targeted stakeholder consultation, around 70% was industry lobby groups. Uh, the targeted stakeholder consultation this summer, uh, we didn't even get a breakdown of like how much industry and how much other interests were consulted. So we don't know. The uh, scenarios that the uh, commission is considering were only disclosed to, to these uh, targeted stakeholders and not uh, in public. Uh, as I said, patents were ignored. Unverifiable claims of benefits are still uh, used as a motivation, as a, as a basis uh, for this uh, deregulation. And in one of the lobby documents, I saw that DG Agriculture advised industry uh, that they should play uh, more of a key role in communicating uh, the, the benefits of these technologies uh, to the larger public because that, you know, public acceptance is really important. So I don't see how this can lead to a proposal that serves the public interest or that serves the interest of the, of the planet as a whole. Um, I don't see how this impact assessment on this basis can ever get approved. Um, and instead, I, I fully agree with what has been said about the cordon sanitaire. We need a toxic-free politics, just like we need a fossil-free politics. And we need to be more clear on that. Like, there's really no uh, more reason to, to keep listening to uh, these companies and look at these companies for solutions. Instead, we should support 
organic farming, agroecology, and the decades of experience uh, that are in these sectors to make agriculture more resilient and fair. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I wonder if uh, the interpreters were so generous to give uh, uh, um, Claire two more minutes to respond and uh, <laughs> give me one minute to conclude. Is that okay? Two? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Go ahead, you have two minutes. Okay, thank you, Benny, for intervening on my behalf. Okay, first of all, just a couple of facts. I want to recall, because you reminded me, it's probably important too, that what we're talking about here is an initiative that would cover plants and no more than plants. Huh? I mean, I agree, the UK, let's not go there, no? Um, secondly, it's not deregulation, please. I mean, no, sorry, it's not deregulation. Let's, let's be fair. I mean, let's be fair. Um, and thirdly, I'm sorry, the... Some unfair things have been said about what we've done in the consultation. I mean, you talked about not giving a breakdown on the responses. There was a pie chart which said who fell into what category. But anyway, okay, those are the facts. On the spirit of what has been said, and blimey, I would come here every day, this, the, the, the level of oratory is much better than any of the other meetings that I have to go to. So at least it was very interesting to, to listen to what you had to say. Two things. Sustainability. I could not agree more that it's not just about a trait in a particular plant or seed. It's about much more than that. Huh? And finally, diversity. Let's not forget about diversity, please. Huh? Thank you. Thank you also for the briefness. And let me just conclude with, uh, I feel um, the dispute has just about started. And um, I'm looking forward to meeting you all again, probably mid next year for the 10th uh, GMO Free Europe conference, hopefully here again. And I thank uh, you all for joining us. I think it was a really fruitful debate and I very much thank the um, interpreters for the two minutes you have donated to us despite being on strike. Bye-bye.